Modern software projects are a collaboration between a lot of different people that are working on a number of different technical files and systems all together. Managing this wide array of collaboration and technical artifacts requires some sophistication and some software support. This lecture is called Intro to Git. It is about a software tool called Git that helps to manage software files and teams. My name is Professor Don Patterson. Websites consist of many files, and Git is a tool that allows for what we call software change management. One thing to know is that creating software is very collaborative. In contrast to kind of the stereotype of a computer programmer working in a basement, drinking Mountain Dew, uh, you know, for all hours of the night, real software is done in teams with a lot of communication and a lot of coordination. Git is a particular software tool that helps developers manage the many people and the many software, many software code files that they're working with. GitHub is a web-based service that works very closely with the program Git. And finally, SourceTree is one of the many GUIs that's available to work with Git, the program. These are the high-level points I'd like to talk about in this lecture. So let's talk, start with the abbreviation SCM. SCM has a couple possible different ways, things that it stands for. One is software configuration management, and another one is source code management. But generally speaking, what it's referring to is the general or generic term for some kind of a system or software that helps to manage multiple versions of a document, or more commonly, a collection of documents. So what it is, is it's software to help you manage software. Software to help you manage the development of software. And since software is usually a collection of documents, it's software to help you manage that collection of documents. Here's an example of what GitHub looks like when you open it in a web browser. This is a particular view of a collection of documents that I'm using for this, the course that this lecture is a part of. You can see that even though this is a relatively simple file, uh, set of files, there's already a, but, a, bit, a bit of complexity in the um, collection of files. We have several different files. There's some HTML files that are referencing other files. And we suddenly have interdependencies between these different files. There's information about when they changed and what they do. Even with a very, very small number of files, as soon as you have multiple people trying to keep track of what's happening, it's helpful to have some sort of a software uh, code management system um, like GitHub to help with us, help us. Um, you can see as well that in addition to seeing the current, what what this is, is a current state of the files in my in one repository. And you can think of this kind of as a horizontal set, um, a set of all the files at one moment in time, kind of like um, a layer in uh, you know, sediment or something. It, here's a different software repository for a different project that I'm working on for a different class. And what this is, is this is showing how those layers are changing over time. So those a commit represents different layers in time of how files change. And you can see that each one of these commits represents some files that are changing along the way. Being able to manage these changes horizontally and vertically is where part of the complexity comes from. Now you're probably kind of already familiar with this sort of management of versions of files from features that are built into software systems that you're working with already. So a real basic kind of way in which this happens is, for example, the way that Microsoft Word will keep backup copies of a document that you're working on, or autosave copies of a document that you're working on. Now this is important in case your document, if, in case Word crashes or in case your power goes out, the file that you're working on, you don't want to you don't want to lose everything that you've written, and so periodically Microsoft Word will commit that file, will make a copy of that file so that you can go back in time and get the most recently recent uncorrupted version and not have to repeat everything that you've ever done. The Mac operating system has this built into the system in two ways, through something called Time, time Machine, which is its backup system, and also through revision management, which is um, built into applications that access some of those Time Machine features. 
Let's take a uh, let's see, take a look at some of those for starters. So for starters, let's look at what Time Machine looks like. Here's a photo that I took of Time Machine being displayed when it's been activated on my computer. It's hard to get a screenshot of this, so I went ahead and just used a camera. And you can see that what the operating system is showing to me is a sequence of commits. In the, the way in which the commits are made in this case are on a date time um, form and a date time slice. So those sedimentary layers where we think of as different versions of our files are being represented here as a sequence of windows going back in time. And each one of those windows that I see here in Time Machine represent the collection of files that were present at that moment in time. So as I move from one window to another, I'm moving back in time. And as I move from one window to another, several files may have changed. Maybe some files were deleted between one, one window and another. Maybe some files were added between one window and another. Maybe some files were just changed between one window and another. And by moving back in time through each one of these windows, I'm able to see the sequence of changes that have happened to the collection of files. In this case, the collection of files is all of the files on my hard drive going back in time. This is a kind of software change management applied to all the files on my hard drive. Now, if I look at a particular, a particular program running on, Mac, um, on the Mac, for example, the presentation software Keynote, in the menuing system, there is particular access to just the time machine information for just the file that you're currently working on. So it's possible, rather than looking at all of the files going back in time, you can look at just this particular file. And you can say, hey, replace the current version that I'm looking at right now with the last version I saved in case I deleted something accidentally or made some changes I want to throw away. Or I could go back to the last version that I opened, which is maybe you know um, more recent than that. Or I can browse all the versions, which will take me out of this particular program and into the Time Machine interface so I can see all the different versions of this file going back in time. This is an example of change management for the file that I'm working on. Now, Wikipedia also has this kind of feature. You may never have looked into it, but you can look at the edits that have been made to a Wikipedia page. And so in some ways, this is a lot like Microsoft Word's backup copies. My Wikipedia has copies that have been made over time. One thing that's different about Wikipedia's backup or page history, though, is that it shows a variety of different individuals who have edited a particular page. And so in that way, it shows a collabor collaborative change over time. All the people who have changed the document, their changes are recorded and the time has been recorded as well. So each commit, each moment in time in which the page has changed is tagged with both the changes and the people who made the change. Finally, a fourth example of kind of software change management that you've probably encountered before is the Google Docs interface. Google Docs has page history located in one of the uh, menu options. It's not a really often used feature, but it's something that you have access to if you want to look at it. Let me show you an example of what that looks like. So here's a particular Google Doc that I have that, that comes, so I do improv comedy um, as a stress relief and for fun. And so this was a particular document that we were using to create some scenarios for the evening in which we were working. And what you can see is the documents over on the left, a bunch of opening lines. But on the right, you can see the version history that's available for any Google document. And you can see each one of those are commits or moments when different people made changes. And you can go back in time and look at how the document evolved over time by selecting those different commits as they built up like layers in a sedimentary deposit over time. So these are all examples of change management systems that you are probably aware of, but maybe haven't thought of as being all in the same category of features. Now the motivation for this, we've sort of touched on. The motivation for files in general is, well, one, for backups. You want to make sure that if you spill water on your computer or you accidentally delete something or your cat jumps on your keyboard at the, in an opportune moment or your toddler or your junior hire, you want to have a backup. In that case, that enables you to be able to recover from um, some sort of disaster. So that's one reason why change management is helpful. Another one is to have a little bit more robust backup mechanism. So one thing that happens in some highly sensitive um, situations like source code is you wanna make sure that at no point in the evolution of your software 
did someone insert malicious software while you weren't noticing, while you didn't notice? And so one thing that some change management systems enable you to do is to ensure not just that you can see the change in software, but there is integrity to the software that you're working on as well. So that the only things that have changed have been those things that have been committed. Now, of course, more often than not in the software industry, we're interested in backing up collections of files. And this is important because in a particular set of files, there may be dependencies between one file and another. For example, an HTML file might reference a CSS file. And when you change your HTML, you're changing your CSS at the same time. And so when you make a commit, you want to make sure that your HTML and your CSS are updating together so that you don't accidentally have a website that's accessing a CSS file that doesn't exist. And you don't want a CSS file that's never being accessed. You want those changes to be brought together in one particular commit, in one particular change um, of your software system. And this is a, a requirement that acknowledges the interdependencies between files, and so we commit them together. Sometimes you can also have different kinds of preferences and configuration files that are part of this as well. So maybe not necessarily interdependency between different files like HTML and CSS, but maybe some information about how your program should be started or how it should be run, um, where, the, where the database is or what version of libraries you're using. So there are a lot of different things that have to be changed together in order for your software to work. And you need all of those changes to be made in order for your software to work. Software in particular has a sort of a special case of these things. And, and the reason for this is that if you think about software, you may actually have multiple versions of your applications in the wild at one time. And by in the wild, I mean multiple versions running at one time. So for example, you might have a particular version of your software that has been released and is being used by the public, uh, being used by your customers. While that's running, you might also have another version that your developers are working on to introduce new features or to get ready for the next release. So that's two copies of your software that are in the wild. Maybe you have a third version that you've customized for a special client. So maybe you have one version of your software that's for the general public, but maybe you have another version of your software that's for a particular corporate customer that you've made special changes to. Three different versions in the wild. And then maybe there's a completely different version that's taking your product in a conceptually, you know, 180 degree, maybe 90 degree different direction. And that's a fourth version that you have some maybe your Skunk Works team working on. So even just in a very simple sort of description of a software program, it's easy to come up with four different versions that might be operating in the wild. Wow, keeping track of collections of files when you have all these different use cases can be complicated, and that's what motivates having a special kind of software change management system just for software packages. Now, you could imagine that you could do this manually, and by that I mean that every time you changed a file or changed a collection of files, you could copy the entire folder and all of the subfolders, and you could make one copy, and you'd make a whole new copy and label it with the date. And then when you made another change of that, you could make a whole new copy of that folder and label it with the date. It's possible that you could do this manually. However, that means that you're keeping a lot of nearly identical files on your hard drive at the same time. Because when you make a copy of the whole folder, some of the files change, but probably not all of them. Maybe not all your graphics assets changed, for example. So one thing that happens when you do it manually is you duplicate a lot of files. Software change management systems are aware of this and don't duplicate files that don't need to be duplicated. The other thing is that doing this sort of manual process requires a lot of discipline, and that's hard for a collaborative group project. It requires discipline to make sure that the files are in good shape when you copy them. It requires discipline to make sure they stay organized and archived. You need to make sure that you have careful permissions on the files so that people that are able to access these files can and that people who can't, can't. And in some cases, you have the additional complexity of needing to be able to make sure that your intellectual property is properly managed as well. So for example, to make sure that someone didn't introduce a font that you don't have a license to in one of these copies of the folders. So trying to do it manually in some way is possible, but would take an enormous amount of discipline and attention and probably cost in terms of time and manpower and person power in order to uh, make that work. 
So software change management can work with any files, but it's largely used to keep track of software. Version control systems in particular support checking in files and managing the changes of these files, and they automate the management of this software system as well. Examples of such systems are uh, programs that go by the name of CI or CVS or SVN, short for subversion. You may have heard of BitKeeper or Mercurial, or the one that I want to focus on in this lecture, which is Git and the web-based service GitHub, which is, helps support that program. All of this together helps us to avoid something called dependency hell. And dependency hell is a pejorative term that's used to describe the problem that's encountered when libraries don't work together. So libraries generally are software packages that provide some sort of functionality that other software uses. Um, and they take up a lot of space. So one thing that your operating system does, or your, your computer does, is it only keeps one version of a library that many different other software packages can use. And when you want to release your new version of your software, you might need a particular version of that library available. And making sure that the version of the library that you expect is the version of the library that's available is a complicated process because that means that not only does your software depend on your software being up to date, but it also requires you to have a particular version of your software, a, a version of another person's library, the right version as well. And if your operating system doesn't have the right libraries in place with the right versions, then your software can break, not because of any problems in your software, but because the operating system doesn't have the right library. And keeping track of which versions of the library your operating system has is keeping track of dependencies in your software. And trying to fix bad dependencies is where the term dependency hell comes from because it becomes so complicated. You want to change your, the library that your program is using, but when you do that, you break some other program that's on the computer. So without a consistent way of understanding how versions are changing, you might have to keep a separate version of every library for everything that depends on it, which completely um, defeats the purpose of having a library in the first place. All right, so in order to understand how this software change management happens, you need to know about something called semantic versioning. You've, I'm sure you've encountered this before without perhaps ever having anyone describe it to you. But what it is, is it's a numbering system for numbering changes in your software, linear changes over time, for numbering public releases of your software over time. And you see it in version numbers. And the version numbers are typically broken down into three different numbers, a major version, a dot, a minor version, a dot, and then a patch number and a dot. And you increment them individually, and you increment them depending on how a particular release of your software is evolving over time. So when you have some kind of major change to your software, you update the major number. Um, and this is, for example, when a, a previous version of your software won't work with the new version anymore. Something about your new version breaks the old versions working. So you change that version number with a major change. A minor change is used when your software just introduces new features or new functionality, but doesn't break previous versions of the software. And then you increment the patch number when you just make bug, fix, bug, bug fixes or stability fixes or security fixes so that um, your doesn't appear that the program has changed at all, but there might be minor changes under the hood that have been adjusted along the time, along the way. So you've probably seen this if you've looked to download software. So here's an example of downloading Python. Python has a variety of different versions here, and you can see that there's a major, minor, and patch number. Three is the major number. Um, uh, at the top here, nine is the minor number, and then four is the patch number. And you can see that there's a progression over time where three point, uh, what do we got there? 3.9.2, and then you've got uh, 3.9.4, and you've got different versions along the way, depending on how you want compatibility to work. Um, you might have also seen this in the release of the Android operating system. So the Android operating system has some version numbers located in the second column here. The colloquial name is in the first column, so for a long time it was named after desserts, um, kind of ending at pi and then just shifting to numbers like Android 10 but there was a version number associated with them as well. And you can see that when you got down towards like um, the difference between um, a lollipop and marshmallow, the numbers went from five to six, indicating that the software that was running on lollipop 
will no longer run on the version that's running on Marshmallow because the major number has changed. Um, the minor numbers were the only things that were changed in the very beginning. Here's a little bit of a slight, uh, a different representation of these changes along the way. And what I want to make clear is that each one of these numbers, these major, minor, and patch numbers, refer to a whole collection of files together that have been updated in order to change functionality or security or whatever is being hap whatever's happening. So you see that the linear change is proceeding along the bottom. 4.0.0 represents a particular version of a software, a software that is generated from a whole collection of files. So when we go from 4.0.0 to 4.0.1, although our versioning number has just updated by one on the patch, that mean, that probably reflects many different files changing between those two different versions. So we move forward to 4.1.0 and 4.1.1, we see that by moving from 4.0 to 4.1, we probably introduce new features to the software. And yet, someone who's running 4.0 can interact with someone who's working on 4.1. When we got to 4.1.2, however, the changes that we made to the collection of software between 4.1.2 and 5.0.0 were so drastic that someone working with a five version of our software could no longer interact with someone working on a four version of our software. So we updated our major number along the way. So notice that these numbering systems is just for releases of our software, public numbering of the application that we're releasing. It's kind of less helpful for active development on the internal side, but this is how you probably first encounter some of this change management for software as a consumer of software services. So now it's helpful to introduce some vocabulary that we use when we're working with Git. So let's start with the term repository. Repository refers to um, a location where files and their history are kept. So it's not just one collection of files at a given time, it's the entire history of those files and all the changes that have been made over time. That repository, like a place where that repository often lives is on GitHub. So GitHub, for example, will have all the files at a moment in time and the whole history as well. But when you work with Git and you work with GitHub, you're going to take a copy of that repository and move the whole history and all of the files onto your computer in order to work with it. The term checking out means to take one of those commits and move all of that software onto your computer and make it sort of visible in your file system so that you're working with one moment in time. This is like Time Machine has all these different steps. Checking out means taking all the files from one of those steps in Time Machine or taking all of the files from one layer in that sediment. The working copy is just referring to the copy of the files that you have checked out, probably on your local computer and possibly you've edited them since you've checked them out. Checking in or committing means to, means to add another chunk to that history of files add another chunk to Time Machine, add another um, node onto that progression of versioning numbers. Sending all of your changes back to the repository um, so that you now have a new node in your history of progression of files. That's, that's fine for a linear progression of files, but some of the complexity in development happens because we don't always have the same files working in a line. Sometimes two people might check out code and start working on them in parallel. This is called branching. For example, maybe I will check out a copy of a website and you will check out a copy of a website and we'll have all the HTML and all the CSS files and all the supporting files, all the assets, and I'll start making copies to my branch and you'll start making copies to your branch. And so our versions will start to diverge in that, in that way. Merging refers to the process of trying to bring those files back together, those whole file sets back together and trying to um, make sure that we have a consistent record of all the changes that we've made in our parallel edits. Sometimes that merging process will result in a conflict. For example, maybe I've changed my HTML file so that I'm referencing one font, and you've changed the same HTML file so you're referencing a different font. That creates a conflict when we try and merge them. That requires us to resolve the conflict, and that means talking to each other editing the files so that we agree on how we want the merge to be resolved, how we want that conflict to be fixed, so that we can go back on working on just one version of our software going forward. 
visually, here's a little bit of an example of what that looks like. So what I want to draw out for starters is we're going to start at the top and move through time. The orange boxes on the left, T1 and T2, represent the public releases of our software that would have numbers associated with them, 4.0.0, 4.0.1. Each one of the boxes, though, represents a complete collection of many different files at one time. The yellow represents our trunk, or our main software development line. Starting with version 1, we'll make another commit, and that commit will be a branch, while well, trunk, trunk refers to going down this main line. That develops over time. We start with one though, and we branch our software and make some changes and eventually make a commit that becomes number two. We then make some additional changes to one or multiple version files in our software, and we commit that, and that becomes number three, um, and follow on to our branch. Now we like the changes that we've made, and we'd like to move them back into our trunk. That requires us to merge them back into commit number four. So we merge them back into commit number four, hopefully resolving any conflicts that are, are present. Um, and then we decide, hey, it's time to make a release. We like the cha changes. We're going to number them, and we're going to use our semantic versioning, and we're going to push them out to the public. That's going to exist over there as a version that people are using. But in the meantime, our developers are going to continue working on our files. And so we're going to branch from four again. We're going to create, make some changes, we're going to edit our files, and then we're going to commit them as commit number five. And this is where it gets a little bit crazy, because our developers are now going to make another branch from, not four, but from five. Make some changes, make commit six. Make some more changes, make commit seven. Maybe at that point, we like the way seven is working, and we would like to get them re pull them back into our main trunk. So we'll merge them back into our main trunk with commit 9, and then maybe we'll release them to the public again as a new version of our software, which here is labeled T2. But way back up at version 5, we had a different set of developers that decided to branch off from, not from the trunk, but a branch from a branch. And that became commit number 8. And we have a special name for that. We call that a fork. And what happens with a fork is it's a collection of software that changes so much that it's unlikely to be moved back into the main trunk. It's kind of like a speciation event in evolutionary biology, as if two different birds on the Galapagos Islands got separated by geography and stopped interbreeding and suddenly became so different that they couldn't breed with each other anymore. And they become, in this case, a separate software entirely eventually perhaps coming, uh, becoming another commit, commit number 10. For those of you who have computer science background, we might think about the representation of the way that files move through this system. Um, they are going to change over time, and they're not called a linked list, which is a technical computer science term for a data structure. And that's because we can branch, and so it's not linear. But it's also not a tree, because a tree doesn't allow us to have merges back together. Another way we could describe it is as a directed graph, but it's not a directed graph either because what time does is it prevents us from having cycles or circles in our, in our graph structure here. Instead, the, way that we re the representation that we use for software change management is called a directed acyclical graph, a DAG for short, or sometimes it's also called a lattice. So for those of you who are interested in the computer science representation of these things, what we're working with here is a lattice. Few more vocabulary terms. The term clone, that means to make a copy of an entire repository, history, files, and everything. Delta compression. Delta compression is one of the big benefits that the software change management system does for us because what it does is it only keeps information about changes between one commit and another. It doesn't keep track of all of the different files and make a whole new copy. That's the re real key to why software change management is feasible, because we're only keeping track of the deltas between each change, not all a new copy of all the different files. The term tag means to give a particular commit a name, for example, giving it the name in a semantic versioning system. The, the verbs push and the verbs pull refer to synchronizing two different repositories. So taking my history of changes and your history of changes and put, merging them together to make sure that we have a consistent view of the history and changes of our um, software. 
So one thing that I want to point out here, and this is sort of slightly tangential to the technical things that we're talking about here, is an issue of vocabulary that we use. Traditionally, that trunk that we have been that I showed you, that yellow line that goes down the middle, that's been called the master line in our software. One thing that we've become very sensitive to, and I think appropriately so, is the way in which our vocabulary reflects a kind of value system that we don't we no longer subscribe to. So one of the um, one of the things that's changed over time is what we're going to refer to, how we're going to refer to that. So where did that term come from? Well, it comes from a variety of different software packages that have been developed over time. So the, originally, the, the first system was called, the first system I know of was called RCS, a revision control system, and it had two programs called CI and CO. And that was around 1980. Um, that was followed by a, pro, by a um, software package called Current Version System. And this was the first one that attempted to do um, conflict management and merge management, try and resolve those things automatically. That was about 1986. Subversion was introduced about 2004, and this was a little bit more sophisticated. And this is where we started getting our um, idea of there being a master line or, an, or a trunk in our software. Git, which was introduced about 2005, was, it was developed by the Linux developer, developer team, um, and it was to help manage the complexity that was present in the um, Linux operating system. And then finally, we saw a move towards the web-based support for the Git software, GitHub, which started about 2009, and since then has really started to dominate a lot of the software configuration management. But this term, master, that has been introduced for the primary line down the center is a term that we're working hard to get rid of because of its connotations to um, racial, uh, to racism in American histories, in the history of America. There are a lot of places in which the computer terminology have certain kinds of um, echoes of um, racial injustice present in them. And one of those places is the term master and slave that's often used to describe the relationship between two computers. And right now there's an active movement within the software industry to try and use um, less biased terms to describe the relationship between computers. For example, instead of saying master and slave, we might say client and server. Um, instead of saying whitelist and blacklist, we might say an allowed list and a block list. Trying to remove those terms from our vocabulary which reflect a, a, either a racist past or um, cause us to think about things in racialized terms now because we want our community to be as just as possible and one of the ways that we do that is to start to um, use terminology that is not offensive. This is a reference to a New York Times article that's about this that was um, published recently and it gives a little bit of the background of the ways in which different companies are, are tackling uh, changing the vocabulary that we use um, in software. So I bring this up right now because that trunk line uh, has traditionally been called the master line. And really just recently, GitHub has started renaming all of those master lines instead to use the term main line to get away from some of the racist connotations associated with the term master and uh, um, slave and, and also. Many major software companies now have um, kind of style guides for removing this kind of language from their software repositories. So I think that's great and I want to encourage it. GitHub the web-based support for Git is a web-hosted repository, a place where you can keep your software and all its history together. It is also a collaboration site. And so on top of all of the branches, it provides kind of social support for having conversations and forums around changes in your software, around commits, and around different kinds of events that are tagging and different things that are happening in your software. It also provides support for different kinds of quality assurance and security assurance um, in your software as well. So it takes Git, it gives Git a place to find software, but it also builds a lot of value added services on top of that as well. Git is typically a command line program, but there are a number of different GUIs that you can use to help you manage your software repository, to ma help manage Git. One I want to focus on is called SourceTree, a program from a company called Atlassian that's used very often in professional software teams. There are other ones that are available as well that you're welcome to try out also, such as GitHub Desktop or Git Kraken. These are alternatives that students sometimes um, like to use. 
In this class, I'm going to focus on source tree, describing source tree, but many of the software features are duplicated in the other ones, at least the ones that we're going to use. You'll also need to make an account on GitHub in order to connect the two, to connect source tree to GitHub. And when you do, what source tree is going to do for you is help you clone a repository or to take some software that's present on GitHub to reach out, grab all of the files and all the history and move them down onto your local soft, onto your local hard drive so that you can work with them. This is called cloning a repository or cloning a GitHub repository because it's a repository that exists on GitHub. When you do that, and when you open up SourceTree, this is what SourceTree looks like when it's pointed at the repository that's located on your computer. Here you see um, the repository for the software that I've been keeping track of for this class. And that line of blue dots represents the sequence of commits that been, have been made over time. Now, for the most part in this class, we're not going to do a lot of branching and merging or conflict resolution. We're just primarily going to use um, Git as a way to keep track of back, backups and changes to our software over time. So we see here the history with commits represented as blue dots. You can see the most recent commit is highlighted. And when I do that, you can look in the bottom left and see that there are four files with yellow icons that are the files that were changed in this particular commit. When I highlight one of them, fontsample.html, over on the right, you can see the details of how that file was changed between the different commits. Red indicates code that was removed, and green indicates code or text that was added. So you can see exactly what sorts of changes were made from one commit to another. This visualization helps to reinforce your mental model or helps to um, un help you build a mental model of how your software is changing over time. You might find it inter interesting to use this same technique to look at software in the wild. For example, the Bitcoin software or the Bitcoin core software, which is a um, reference version of the Bitcoin client, is on GitHub and it's open source software and you can download it and you can look at it in SourceTree. And so this is what a professional, highly collaborative piece of software looks like. And in this case, I show it to you because there are a lot of different branches in the software. The different colors represent different branches. Um, and you can see that there are a lot of different tags as well. And I've highlighted one particular commit here, not the most recent one, but that shows you what changed between that commit and the previous commit. And there are just four files shown there, but there are probably many, many more files that were changed as well. And you can look over on the right and you can see what changed in the, actual, you know, in the Bitcoin client software along the way. <clears throat> if you find this interesting or you find it confusing, and you would like to learn a little bit more, there are a lot of resources to help you learn more details about Git online. A couple that I would point you to is, for first, first of all, is just the article on version control on Wikipedia. That'll give you a little bit more background and history about version control, generally speaking. If you're interested in learning more about Git, GitHub has a sequence of tutorials that are very helpful for helping you understand how Git and GitHub work together. They're different projects. GitHub is a service on the web, and Git is a, is a program that you run. But they work together, and GitHub helps support learning how they work. There's also a Git tutorial on Code Academy that I recommend as well. Um, that's sort of an online course in how to learn Git. All right, so the key points of this lecture were very technical. Websites consist of many different files, and Git is one widely used tool for managing those files in particular, how they change. We need to manage them because creating software is collaborative. And Git helps us to tamp down on that chaos and to get, a rain, get our hands around all the different changes that are happening. As developers are man, um, Git helps developers to manage the many people that are changing these source code files. GitHub is a web service that works with Git. And SourceTree is a GUI that helps us to run Git more clearly so that we can visualize what's happening as we connect our software changes to the changes that other people are making on the web. This is a technical deep dive. It's going to be helpful in some of the work that we do in future lectures in this series. I hope that it's supporting you and your team as you make changes to your software and you attempt to build great software for other people as well. Thank you for your attention.